Good afternoon. I'm Ken Radiola, mental health distinguished educator at the Maine Department of Education and member of the Office of School and Student Supports Coordinated School Health Team. I am joined today by my colleagues and team members, Tammy Diaz and Susan Berry. We would like to welcome everyone to the first session of our webinar series focused on the CDC promoting mental health and well being in schools, an action guide for district leaders. Today, we are honored to have two key contributing authors of this guide with us from the United States Center for Disease Control to provide the background and overview of the resources. First, we have Dr. Natalie Wilkins. Natalie Wilkins is a health scientist and team lead for the Division of Adolescent and School Health. Since joining CDC in 2008, her work has focused primarily on promoting positive youth development through applied research and knowledge translation within the context of injury and violence prevention and adolescent health promotion. Natalie has led not numerous projects in collaboration with public health partners at the federal, state, and local levels to prevent child maltreatment, youth violence, and uh, suicide and substance use, and to promote mental health and sexual health among young people. She has also led efforts to identify links between multiple forms of violence, injury, and other public health outcomes. She received a BA in psychology and sociology from the University of Richmond and an MA and PhD in community psychology from Georgia State University. We also have George Verlinden, <clears throat> who is a senior health scientist with the Division of Adolescent and School Health. George earned her doctorate and master's degree in psychology from Tulane University. She completed her postdoctoral training at Morehouse School for Medicine and held a combined appointment in Georgia State's Center for Leadership in Disability. George's work at CDC focuses on public health approaches to promoting mental health and to protecting the well being of students at risk for negative health outcomes. We greatly appreciate both of you for investing your time in the mental health and well being of students across the country and for joining us today in Maine. I want to remind participants that our future webinar sessions will be devoted to reviewing each individual strategy within the guide in more detail. At this, at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Wilkins. Thank you. Worsening mental health. Uh, the worsening mental health um, of young people is that there have been a lot of tools and resources that have been developed to help schools and district leaders um, to put in place different mental health and well-being strategies that promote the well-being of, of students. But one of the things that we heard from our partners is that it can be really overwhelming as a school or district leader to even figure out where to start with all of these tools, these resources, this research. And so one of the things that we decided to do here at CDC is to really develop a guide that helps provide guidance for school and district leaders on where to start for mental health and well-being strategies, specifically looking at those strategies that show the strongest evidence for having impact on mental health in schools. So the purpose of the action guide really isn't to provide a comprehensive um, list of all of the important activities and approaches that schools are putting in place that support mental health and well-being, but more so just to provide sort of a guidepost as to those strategies that have the strongest evidence base to date as an entry point um, for where, where folks can consider improving or strengthening their existing mental health and well-being strategies. This is just a really brief overview of the process that we used for developing the action guide and where the information in the guide comes from. So as I alluded to before, we started with a really rigorous review of the scientific literature to find out what are those programs, interventions, and policies that science shows can have a significant impact on mental health outcomes in schools. And then once we sort of went through that process and identified those strategies, we also talked with key partners in the field. So we talked with students, we talked with parents, we talked with teachers, um, school mental health support staff, school and district leaders, all so that we could get more information on not only what are the strategies that they're seeing in their experience that are improving the mental health and well-being of young people, but also what are the key implementation considerations for making sure that these strategies are put in place effectively 
and in an equitable way as well. So thinking about before the students who are experiencing disproportionate risk for mental poor mental health outcomes, what are the things that we need to be considering and thinking about when we're putting these evidence-based strategies into place to make sure we're moving the needle and improving mental health and well-being for those students? So all that information combined together is what really served as the basis for the Mental Health Action Guide. So um, these are the six evidence-based strategies for supporting mental health and well-being in schools that we found from that rigorous review of the scientific evidence. Um, I'm going to provide a really brief overview just to lay a foundation for what is included in each of these strategies, but it's going to be really exciting um, throughout the course of this webinar series to really be able to dive in more into each one of these and to hear your reflections um, and your feedback and conversations around what it'll take to put these kinds of strategies in place in schools and districts that you work in. Before I get started into um, getting into more detail with each of these strategies, though, one thing I did want to mention is that as we were developing the action guide, we were really focusing also on how we could best connect the dots between the strategies that we found in the research literature and the existing MTSS or multi-tiered systems of support that many schools and districts are currently using to guide and structure their mental health support services. And so throughout the guide, you'll see that we indicate when we um, discuss a specific approach under each of the strategies, where in the, the MTSS each of those approaches are likely to fall. Um, and I will say because um, we take a really public health and prevention approach to mental health and well-being, many of the strategies that are included in the Mental Health Action Guide tend to be more at that universal or tier one level or tier two level. Um, again, because the focus is, is primarily on more of those sort of universal and, and primary prevention approaches. So the first strategy from the action guide is increasing students' mental health literacy. And schools can do this by delivering classroom-based mental health education curricula. This is at that um, sort of tier one universal level. And this kind of content really focuses on reducing stigma around mental health, key knowledge about different mental health um, related information, information on how to seek help if you or a friend or someone in your social circle is experiencing mental health distress or crisis. And these can be offered in health education classes or in other classes like science classes, language arts classes, and again, are really geared towards a more universal approach for all students. Um, schools can also implement peer modeling programs and these programs are focused on teaching young people how to model positive attitudes and coping skills. And again, that help seeking behavior for their peers to help peers develop these skills and model that behavior um, and, and increase awareness of, of key mental health skills um, within the student population. So again, when we talk to those key partners in the field, about what it takes to effectively and equitably implement these strategies, these kinds of strategies, we heard a couple of different things. One of the things that we heard is that it's really important for schools to be thinking about ways to make mental health support more available by partnering with community services and partners um, to provide those kinds of mental health services. So again, a key part of mental health literacy programs is helping to teach young people how to seek help when they need it and so making sure that when young people then are seeking help, that there's somewhere to refer them to, there's somewhere to, to connect them to for that extra support. And then we also heard that it was really important to consider how parents, caregivers, and the broader community views mental health, some of the cultural norms um, and social norms related to this. We know that there's still a tremendous amount of stigma around mental health. So just keeping that in mind, again, when you're encouraging young people to seek help and reaching out for help, just having an awareness of what those sort of cultural norms look like um, in your local community. The second strategy from the guide is promoting mindfulness. Schools can do this by delivering classroom-based mindfulness education. Again, at that universal or tier one level, these can be delivered in health education classes or other classes. And then also dedicating time for students to independently practice mindfulness. For students that may need 
additional support, schools can also consider offering smaller group sessions of mindfulness activities that are geared towards a specific skill um, or a specific um, emotion regulation technique. In terms of implementation and equity, we heard that it's really important to consider including student voice in the development of mindfulness activities. And a couple of examples that we heard from folks were asking students what visualiz visualization strategies they like best. So when thinking about these different mindfulness and visualization techniques, letting students sort of take the lead on, on what they'd like to, to center that practice around from their own experiences. And then offering students with the opportunity to lead these mindfulness exercises as well. The third approach, or sorry, strategy in the action guide is promoting social, emotional, and behavioral learning. At that universal tier one level, this includes providing classroom instruction focused on building social skills and emotional development. Again, this is geared towards all students and can occur in health classes or other classes. And then for students who have additional needs, offering more targeted education in small groups um, focused on teaching specific skills to help with emotional development. When we talked with folks about things to consider when putting in place these social emotional behavioral learning approaches, we heard that it can be really helpful to use screening tools to help to decipher and, um, and determine the needs of, of individual students and whether they would benefit from a universal type of social emotional behavioral learning program, or if their needs might be better suited and better met by one of these more tier two small group approaches. But we were also cautioned to be careful because some of these screening approaches um, can be a bit biased. And so depending on your student population, making sure that you're reviewing those tools and making sure that there may not be some unintended consequences where students might be misplaced because of bias that exists in, set in those tools. And then another um, consideration or recommendation we got was considering transformative social and emotional learning approaches. This is a certain subset or type of social and emotional learning approaches that also integrates um, content and focus on inequity. And so students can work as a part of these kinds of approaches to examine and identify inequities that exist in their community and can be tailored to the specific populations um, of your local context. The fourth approach uh, from the action guide, or the fourth strategy rather, is enhancing connectedness among students, staff, and families. And schools can do this by providing relationship building programs. Um, and what these programs typically look like, they typically focus on building that bi-directional communication and relationship between teachers and other school staff and parents and families. And oftentimes these programs will entail some sort of coaching or training session for both teachers as well as for parents um, separately. And those training and coaching sessions will often focus on um, positive communication tactics, um, for parents, they'll oftentimes focus on an overview of why parent engagement is so critical and important for youth outcomes and the students that they support. And also, these programs will often include a peer connection component as well that's focused on building relationships between students. In terms of thinking about effective implementation and equity, um, again, thinking about those students who are most likely to be marginalized within a school population and feel disconnected is really critical when putting in place these relationship building programs. And a couple of examples and ideas um, that we have seen both from the research literature as well as um, through our conversations with partners in the field are things like affinity groups for students of color, LGBTQ students, or students with disabilities can really help to boost these relationship building programs in a way that really helps to, to center and focus on those students who are more likely to be marginalized and experiencing those disproportionate um, outcomes related to mental health and well-being. We also heard a little bit about the importance of anti-bullying and anti-harassment policies, specifically including um, student and staff populations that are more likely to be marginalized. So one of the common um, 
groups that are, are left out of these kinds of policies are students or staff who identify as sexual or gender minorities. So assessing school policies and seeing if there are ways to um, enhance and promote the protection of harassment against these, these groups of students and um, staff can also make sure that your relationship building and connectedness strategies are centering those that are most likely to be um, at risk. The fifth strategy from the action guide is providing psychosocial skills training and cognitive behavioral interventions. These approaches really focus on building skills among students. So the first, promoting acceptance and commitment to change. This is an approach that's really um, derived from dialectical behavioral therapy. And what it focuses on is helping students to identify their emotions and accept them. And then to think about and identify what are their values and goals and commit to behaviors that are in alignment with those values and goals. Cognitive behavioral interventions focus on helping students to identify unhelpful thought patterns oftentimes um, and then provide skills and instruction and practice on how to um, create more positive thought patterns and behaviors. And then finally, um, coping skills training groups. These are oftentimes more of a tier two strategy that are focused on specifically developing um, coping strategies, particularly for transitions or students that are going through different transitions, either academically or in their lives. Um, and again, are oftentimes offered at that tier two level. For implementation and equity, we heard from folks that it's really important to consider particularly with these kinds of programs and approaches, the unique needs of students who have been exposed to trauma. And it can be really difficult, we were hearing from folks, to, to know which students have experienced trauma um, and the, the kind of impact that it's having on their lives. So one of the recommendations that folks had was as much as possible putting in place universal trauma-informed policies and practices um, for the entire school environment so that when these kinds of programs are being put in place, there's already that sort of safeguard or that, that routine practice um, of engaging with students in ways that are less likely to, um, to re-traumatize. And then finally, our sixth strategy, um, last but most certainly not least, is supporting staff well-being. One thing I wanna note here is that um, I definitely don't have to tell people on this call that the past several years have been tremendously difficult in terms of the competing priorities, um, many, many stressors that school and district level um, staff have been experiencing. And there are a number of resources that we link to in the guide for more comprehensive um, uh, list of different kinds of approaches to promote school staff well-being. A lot of those approaches include things like making sure that um, some of the removing some of those stressors and barriers, um, making sure that teachers have the time that they need to complete the tasks that they have um, that they're responsible for, making sure that teachers um, and school staff have have a voice in decision making. But again, given the nature of the kinds of approaches that we were looking for for this action guide, those that have been really rigorously tested and shown to have significant impact on mental health outcomes, the two approaches that came up in our search of the literature um, are more individual focused approaches. And part of the reason for that is because these kinds of approaches are easier to test in a rigorous way versus the, those broader policies um, that are still really critical and foundational for supporting um, school staff, mental health and well-being. So just with that context and caveat, the two approaches that we um, found in the research evidence for supporting staff, mental health and well-being were mindfulness-based training programs, similar to the ones um, that we found for students, and then also providing therapeutic resources, which really is referring to um, interactive workbooks that again are sort of rooted in that dialectical therapy tradition where it walks teachers through a process of identifying their emotions, accepting them without judgment, identifying their values and goals, and then creating sort of an action plan for meeting those goals and values. And both of these strategies, again, have, have shown to have a significant impact on school staff, mental health, and well-being, which in and of itself is incredibly important. But also, we know that when school staff 
are taken care of and, and feel well, mental health wise, physical health wise, um, it creates a positive school climate. And that then helps to further um, increase the mental health and well being of students as well. It creates this really sort of synergistic effect. So, a really critical and foundational strategy. In terms of implementation and equity, um, what we heard from folks again when we talked to partners. Um, was that it's really important to consider those teachers who are more likely to be marginalized or experiencing discrimination um, to make sure that when these practices are being put in place that their needs are being um, attended to and, and centered. And so a couple of examples that we heard from folks on ways to do this is by offering culturally relevant mental health and well-being supports that are accessible to staff. And then similar to some of the recommendations around um, the school connectedness programs and how to make sure that students who are adversely affected are being included um, and, and feeling a sense of belonging, offering um, affinity groups and uh, other support activities that promote resilience for teachers and school staff was another thing that we heard could be really important. So those are the six strategies. Um, that are included in the action guide. In the guide, we also include a few additional approaches that we term promising practices. And these were approaches that have been shown to promote nurturing and welcoming school environments, and also have some emerging evidence showing a significant impact on mental health in school-based settings as well. But these programs didn't quite meet our level or standard of evidence. Um, so we didn't include them as, as one of the foundational six strategies, but decided to still include them as a promising practice with the disclaimer that they need to be studied and researched a bit more because they came up in multiple of our sessions um, with our partners in the field as really critical and important as well. So honoring that sort of lived experience and then given um, the emerging evidence around their effectiveness, they're included in the guide as well. And the first one here is restorative practices, which folks may be familiar with already. Um, but restorative practices focus on building warm relationships between school staff and students while also still focusing on accountability for students' behavior. And oftentimes, these practices will include proactive circles, um, which are or, or sessions, small group sessions, where they're facilitated by a school staff member and focus on setting expectations and building relationships and connections between students and between students and staff. Um, they'll also oftentimes include more restorative types of circles or conferences to help mediate peer conflicts and also to help repair relationships when some sort of behavioral infraction has occurred. The second of the promising strategies that we include in the action guide is genders and sexualities alliances or GSAs. Um, what we know from the emerging research literature is that when schools put in place these GSA groups, which are really geared towards providing social support for LGBTQ students and their allies, um, we see that there are improved outcomes um, in terms of suicide for LGBTQ youth. We also see that outcomes improve not just for suicide, but also for other violence related outcomes, including teen dating violence for their heterosexual peers. And so we're not exactly sure um, what is the mechanism behind this for why there's such a broad impact for both LGBTQ students as well as heterosexual students with GSAs. But one of the theories that we are currently testing um, and looking at with another study is that when schools overtly support um, the most vulnerable students in their student population, all students feel safer. So um, we're excited to, to dive into that research a bit more and learn a little bit more with some of our ongoing research projects. But that's sort of the running um, hypothesis that we have around that for right now and what the emerging data is telling us. I also just wanted to mention um, again here that the strategies that are included in the action guide are really focused on those that have the strongest and most robust evidence base as of right now. But there are so many other really critical services, practices, and interventions that schools are putting in place now that, that have a tremendous impact on mental health and well-being. So other examples could include things like school-based nutrition programs um, or physical activity programs. We know that it's really critical, that good nutrition is really critical for mental health as is physical activity. So just examples of other, other um, services and strategies that schools are putting in place that, that contribute substantially to, 
a comprehensive mental health and wellness approach. And so the last thing that I wanted to mention um, to you all is uh, a couple of things that we're very excited about. So in addition to the action guide, we have two additional resources that are going to be released next month. We don't have a specific date yet, but I promise that we will share them as soon as they're, as soon as they're launched and available. Um, but we developed these two tools to help provide sort of the next step for how school or district leaders could take the information in the action guide and start to put it in place and start to implement it um, within their schools or districts. The first tool is a how to get started guide. And in this guide, we really provide some concrete tools for school or district leaders and their support teams to go through and identify what are the mental health and well-being strategies that we currently have in place in our school or district. Then to sort of systematically look through the six strategies from the action guide and determine, do any of these meet some of the gaps that we have in our current mental health and wellness strategies? And if so, which of these strategies are most likely to be relevant, to be feasible um, for our local context? And just helping folks to sort of prioritize which of those strategies might be the best fit. And then from there, we also offer a tool as a part of this how to get started resource to really concretely start to think about who needs to be involved if we're to implement these priority approaches that we've identified. Um, what does the timeline look like? What are the key next steps to really get started with implementation? And then the second tool is a presentation template that's really geared towards creating a, a, a PowerPoint presentation so that other folks don't have to spend their time doing that. It's adaptable, it's geared towards school and district leaders or their support teams to be able to communicate about their mental health and wellness priorities. So it includes slides that have all the information on the strategies from the action guide. It also includes fillable slides where folks can take the information that they sort of brainstormed and gone through in the how to get started guide around what they want to prioritize, who's going to be in charge of what, and they can just copy and paste and put that into this presentation. Um, and the intent is that then folks could use this presentation to communicate about their mental health and well-being priorities to any partner or audience that they'd like to. So that could be to school staff, that could be to families, it could be to district leadership um, or school boards. So it's really meant to just save folks some time um, and sort of do some of the legwork of communi communicating about these priorities um, so that folks don't have to spend their time doing that. And with that, I will just thank everyone so much for your time and attention.